This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com <clears throat> Okay, Bruchem Abam, welcome everyone. We're continuing our Shir on Sefer Bamidbar. Actually, this will be our last Shir on Sefer Bamidbar. So we want to thank our sponsor for Sefer Bamidbar, Rabbi Isaac Yasolovsky, the sponsor of Nishmas' father's Yasid was Tesvav Sivan, Began Eden Tehem Nuchasay, Shabi Amel Siyosha for his whole family, for Simcha Sanachas, Parnas Ravach, Gezunt, Arbi Asgol Tzedek. Shir Manser Ba Midbar and Bez Shem Devarim are also sponsored by our dear friend Dr. Zakheim, who is the Lenishmas of Shlom Eliezer ben Rav Yaakov Zakheim, and the Lenishmas Dr. Zakheim's mother, Rivka Bas Tovia Halevi, Began Eden Tehem Nuchasam. They should be Melitza Yisham for their whole family, Arbi Asgol Tzedek. Okay, so tonight we officially begin the three weeks. So, in case you don't have yet your copy of The Darkness and the Dawn, or let's say you have it, but you don't know where you put it, <laughs> or maybe you gave it to someone, Just give it to them again. They don't even remember that you gave it to them. So, you could get your copy right here, The Darkness and the Dawn. Oh, I'm on mute? Sorry about that. Okay, I'm back with you. Okay, so uh, tonight is the 17th day of Tammuz. Five great tragedies happened on the 17th of Tammuz, starting with the breaking of the Luchais. And the Torah was burnt, and a Tzelem was put up in the Heichal. Five tragedies are mentioned in the Mishnah at the end of Masechta Tainus. <clears throat> it's been a disa- basically a lightning rod of disaster throughout history, for the Jewish people. Today we're going to learn about a very um, frightening and earth-shattering episode in Jewish history, an episode that continues to reverberate until today. Almost every movement in the Jewish people is a direct result of this uh, historical event, whatever that movement may be. Any stream in Judaism whether to the right or to the left, is a direct result of the great debacle of Shabtai Tzvi. And we're going to learn today about his most outspoken opponent. Now, if you were hoping to go into the fast day with a nice, fuzzy, feel-good message about Shavas Vatamas, you're on the wrong channel, okay? Just change the channel. Or, wrong show, okay? Because this is not for you. If you like the um, party line version of Jewish history, also, wrong channel, okay? If you like to just uh, take in what everybody thinks, now, this, you got the wrong program. But if you want to find out actually what happened in, the Jewish, in Jewish history and what the issues, we, how we should view the issues that we face today, then this is one of the most important events to understand, to recognize, and to realize that at the time, very few people stood up against it. And as few people that stood up against the Shabtai Tzvi, even though there was opposition among the Rabbanim, although it wasn't that outspoken, he only had one major outspoken opponent at the time. And that individual was Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas. Rabbi Jacob Sasportas, who was born in 1610, who passed away in 1698. The Chida in the Shem Hagadolim, he has almost no information offered on Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas. He says, you want to know about Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas? Look, you know, the Shem HaGdom of the Chida is, consists of two parts. You have all the G'doylem that lived before the Chida, in the first part called Mareches G'doylem, and then you have all the Svarim that were written before the Chida, in the uh, second part called Ma'areches Svarim. So he says, if you want to know about Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, go to Ma'areches Svarim. And in his entry for, to one of the Svarim of Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, he says, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas was from the West, and he came to the East. <laughs> he was from... Okay, so that's the information. Meaning, he was in the Arab world, and he came to the Christian world. He was a rabbi in Hamburg, afterwards a rabbi in Amsterdam, Yes, probably a week, from tom- um, a week from Friday will be at his kever. And he was the Rav of the Svardim in Amsterdam. He was born in Oran. He became a Rav at 24 in Marrakesh, in Fez, in Sali, in Morocco. In 1646, he escaped to Amsterdam. He stayed there until he, became, uh, he was invited 
to the Portuguese community of London. According to many, he accompanied Menashe ben Israel to London, to Oliver Cromwell, to petition the return of the Jewish people. And ultimately, he ended his career as a rabbi of the Portuguese community in Amsterdam. And he was probably... He, no, I take that back. He was the most outsta- outspoken opponent to the Shabtai Tzvi. Now, what was the general attitude to Shabtai Tzvi when Shabtai Tzvi revealed himself in 1648? We know Kabbalistically, there was a tradition, something big was going to happen in the year Zeus. Zeus is 408, 1648. And something big did happen. Namely, Shabtai Tzvi revealed himself, and it was a year of terrible disaster for the Jewish people, the years of Tach v'tat. And what was the reaction of the Rabbanim at the time to the revelation of Shabtai Tzvi? There were many Gedolim who did not believe in the Messianic uh, prophecy of Shabtai Tzvi. However, they didn't say a word. Many Chachamim did not speak out against it. And the reason they didn't speak out against it is because Shabtai Tzvi's revelation brought about a tremendous movement of repentance. People began to feel for the first time that it was going to be a reality, that the Jews were going to be redeemed, they were going to leave their Europe, they were going to leave the European continent and go to the land of Israel. And Jews began to repent in massive tshuva movement. And therefore the Chachamim said, whether or not we actually think this guy is for real, but you know, good stuff is happening, so let's ride the wave. I even though they were afraid of the repercussions of the, the Gentiles, who probably would not let this happen. So they try to downplay the uh, supernatural element of Shabtai Tzvi, but most Chachamim did not want to rock the boat, and they did not say anything. Number two, many rabbis did not speak out because they were afraid of their congregations. Most Chachamim at the time were tied down to the salaries in their shuls. And the people wanted Shabtai Tzvi. The people wanted it, and if the people want it, then the Chachamim were uh, basically tied down. Many Chachamim believed in the Shabtai Tzvi. I'm not here to say names, even though it was very clear, but one of the all-time great Gedolim in number 19 followed along the Shabtai Tzvi. Not only did he follow along with Shabtai Tzvi, but when uh, the Rav, Rav Aaron Lapafa, in Izmir challenge Shabtai Tzvi, Rav Aaron Lepafa was removed by this Achroin, and Shabtai Tzvi became the Rav in Izmir. So there were great Achroinim, Asher Mipiyam Anuchayim, who uh, supported the Shabtai Tzvi. However, from all the Rabbanim and all the Chacham at that time, Rav Yaakov Sasportas was a lone soldier fighting Shabtai Tzvi. And the question is, why? How was he able to do it? Now the truth is, many Rabbanim identified with uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, but they did not have the audacity to um, they did not have that audacity to speak out against him. Audacity and the, or the, or the audacity or the uh, the courage, right, or the bravery. And the main reason is because they were all subject to the board, and um, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas did not have a position as a Rav with a board. And therefore he was the only rabbi in the time who had the courage to speak out against Shabtai Tzvi. And he felt so lonely and he felt so isolated that he wrote a letter to Rav Rafal Sofino that he says he doesn't even have anyone to talk to because everyone is bribed. Bribed meaning the pressures of their positions are such that they cannot even not speak the truth, they can't think the truth. Now, you know, this is a phenomenon, which is not an isolated phenomenon to 1648. This is a phenomenon that reverberates in every single generation, where the truth is held hostage to the salary. That is a very common phenomenon throughout Jewish history. In fact, Rabbi Yaakov Sasporta says that Ma'atim heim hanegrorim acharai v'nari kasvam. Very few people followed suit. And a lot of the, the Rabbanim did not want to sort of uh, rock the boat and stir things up against their respective kehilais who were very much in support of this messianic fervor. So the question is, how was it 
with all the social pressure of the time, and all the rabbinic pressure of the time, that Rabbi Yaakov Sosportis had the courage to see clearly that this guy is, a, is fraudulent. After all, even Rabbi Yaakov Emden writes in a very powerful book about this subject, called Teiras Haknois, that Shabtai Tzvi was a mekubal, the likes of which no, he was unrivaled. So how was Rabbi Yaakov Sesportus able to see through this whole uh, uh, fervor and through this uh, charlatan? And this is something that we need to use as a model in every generation. Because Shabtai Tzvi was not the only false messiah in history. And I'm not going to name all of them in history, but there were many, many more than 20 major false messiahs throughout history. And, you know, in our generation, or in any other generation, people like to point to miraculous abilities of whoever it may be. The first thing you need to know is Pesi Yamin Lechol Davar. The fool believes everything. And don't be... The, the personality of Rabbi Yaakov Sesportas was when he was told, well, Shabtai Tzvi, he made, you know, every night he goes down to the ocean and he splits the sea. And that's what they were saying about him. He said, so what? What does that have to do with whether he's Mashiach or not? He, maybe he splits the sea. He knows the future. It's irrelevant. Whether he does or he doesn't, that has no bearing on... And the truth is that the... It's a very important attitude for a Jew to have, not to be nispoil. Oh, this person, he could look at you. Well, how is that? What is that relevant to? How is that relevant to anything? It's not relevant to halacha. It's not relevant if they give you advice about any issue. How is their ability to change nature or see the future, how does it have any relevance about halacha or hashkafa? So that's a certain attitude that Rabbi Yaakov uh, Sasportas um, intuitively understood not to get carried away with uh, you know, the, the fervor of the reports of the supernatural. And then the next thing he did was he took a very analytical approach to whether this individual met the criteria that we know from Chazal and from the Rishonim if he meets the bill to be Mashiach. So now tonight we're going to learn what are the ingredients of being Mashiach? In other words, let's say you came to my house, you knocked on my door, Gladstein. Yeah, what's up? I'm Mashiach. So, real, so let's, we're going we're gonna to check, right? We have to know where, what are the qualities of somebody who's Mashiach? What ingredients does he have to have? And uh, the first thing that Rabbi Yaakov says, so by the way, after this whole event, he recorded very thoroughly the entire episode, the entire saga, in an amazing work called Sitzatz, Tzitzas Noivel Tzvi. And the first thing that uh, a Jew should be familiar with is the Igeras Teman of the Rambam. The Rambam wrote about a false Messiah. And the Rambam um, writes, the first thing you need to know is where will Mashiach reveal himself? In the land of Israel. That's the first thing. <laughs> if the guy is revealing himself in Izmir, in London, in uh, New York City, he's not Mashiach. I don't care what he does. I don't care how many people he impresses with his prophecy. It's irrelevant. He has to reveal himself in the land of Israel. Otherwise, he doesn't even have a shot. There's nothing to talk about. It's a pasuk, Pisoim Yavoy El Hechaloi, which Rambam interprets, he will suddenly come to his temple. Number two, the Rambam says, we're not going to know anything about him before he reveals himself. He's not going to be, oh, oh, that, yeah, oh, yeah, I know, I know him, I, I remember him. He, you know, I remember I was at his shear. I, I, I remember him. I heard him speak once. Nobody's going to know anything about him. The Rambam. This is the opinion of the Rambam. The Rambam says nobody's going to know not about his father, not about his mother, not about him until he reveals himself. And this is Meduyak, the Rambam says in the Pasach, Tzemach Shemai. Tzemach implies that he sprouts. It's like a sort of like, came out of nowhere. No one's going to know about his aunt, his uncle, his first cousin, his, oh, he's the Machatenister. No, 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 no. I only said that because I was, whatever. It's a famous joke, you know. 
Who's that? He's the Machatena, sir. You know, pal, get you, you know, get your terms straight. That's number two. People are not going to know who he is until he reveals himself, and and he performs great miracles. Number three, the powers of the world, the superpowers of the world, are going to be in awe of him. They're going to be frightened of him from his great miraculous ability, from his wonders that he performs. He's going to be so powerful that he can. Take life at will. He'll have the capacity to say, you know, he's a rebel, he's not doing the right thing, and knock the guy off. So these are three ingredients that the Rambam identifies. Number one, he reveals himself in the land of Israel. Okay? Not in, not in uh, Poland, not in Germany, not in London, not in Flatbush, not in Borough Park, not in Williamsburg. All of these places are very nice places. They have good shopping in all these places. But you, they will, you can't reveal yourself as Mashiach. So if anyone here wants to be Mashiach, just so letting you know, Flatbush, Bar Park, you're not going to find parking anyway. So I would look for other locations. Okay, so that's, that, these are some of the criteria that Rabbi Yaakov Sesports has used to determine the uh, identity or the lack of, of the true Mashiach. Then you need to know that in the 13th century, there was a man by the name of Ben Avraham me Avila, Avila is in Castel, who revealed himself as Mashiach. He was not a very learned person. He did not serve the Talmud Chachamim. And there were reports of his miraculous feats. And they brought the question to the Rajba. Raja, what do you say about this guy? And the Raja didn't want to say the guy is a fake and a fraud. But the Rajba said like this, in order to have prophecy, you need to be a kosher, you need to be a chassid, meaning you need to be pious, you need to have great character. And the tradition of the Jewish people is that we don't accept these people. This is the age-old perspective of Klal Yisrael. Could you imagine, was there anyone ever greater than Moshe? I mean, he, the man's 20 feet tall. Right? He's 10 amas tall. He's 20 feet. And that, that reflected his spiritual stature. And Hashem said, go to the Jewish people. And by the way, the Jews had every reason in the world to want to believe Moshe. First of all, they had a tradition, Hashem's going to redeem them. Number two, they were being afflicted, they were, being, they were suffering in tremendous torture in Mitzrayim. And Hashem tells Moshe, go tell them, Pakoid Yifkoid Eschem. Would there ever be any situation in our history that the Jewish people would be more receptive to a Messiah than Moshe? And Moshe said, are you kidding me? The Heiloyaminuli. They're not going to believe me. They're not stupid. These are Jews. Jews don't believe. That what happened in, in our times? Jews fall for every single nonsense. Yeah, I heard it's a skula. If you walk around the thing nine times, saying backward the 63rd, I mean, come on. It's not Jewish even. The hallmark of the Jew, v'hein lo yaminu. They're skeptical of the, of the supernatural. The Rambam writes, we don't believe in Moshe Rabbein because of any miracles that he performed. So Hashem said, first put your hand in the thing, and it's going to turn white. Moshe said, it's not that going to go, it's the oldest trick in the book. Then throw the stick turn to a snake, nah. and if they don't believe those two things, they'll, they'll believe the third thing. So says the Rajba, the derech of Yisrael, is we don't accept people who claim that they're Mashiach until we investigate and investigate and investigate and investigate. You know why? Because the hallmark of the Jew is MS. And MS means verification. We are Zera MS. And it's better for the Jew to bear the continuous yoke of the Golos than to just say, yeah, yeah, he's Mashiach, he's Mashiach. So now we come to um, the great work, Tzitzas Neuvel Tzvi. What is the Rambam? You can't investigate because he's going to be somebody that appears and nobody knows who he was. There, there are ways How to investigate. You investigate? You're, about, you're about to see. So this guy, let's say the guy, he, he comes out of Flatbush and he says he's Mashiach. You know what? What did he do? He made the pizza store disappear. Big miracle. Say, pal, what, you have any other miracles you could do? He made parking everywhere in Flatbush. Okay? It's a tremendous miracle. Right? It's like the whole world is changing. And then, then, uh, then he made tuna fish, 50 cents a pound. 
So the guy is, it's unbelievable what he's doing. Food, actually, you don't have to take out a mortgage to go shopping for Shabbos. So all these great miracles the guy is doing, and they say, pal, you can't be Mashiach, you know why? Because you didn't bring the Jews back to Eretz Yisrael. So, so the Rambam writes that in order to be Mashiach, you also did not wage war against the enemy of the Jewish people and bring us back to Eretz Yisrael. I don't care how many miracles you did. You, <laughs> you didn't fulfill the basic criteria of Mashiach. Rabbi Yaakov Sesportas writes, look in the Rambam. The Rambam writes in Hilchas Malachim. That if im yamoid melech mi based of it, so he's hoige b'tayra, oisik b'mitzvays, v'yachav kol yisrael lelech ba, he coerces, he forces kai yisrael to follow it, v'yilache melchem ois Hashem, he fights the wars of God. So then he's becheskas mashiach, and if he's successful and he builds the base hamikdash and he brings the Jews back to Israel, he's mashiach. So of all these. 20 false messiahs. Did any of them wage any wars? Only Bar Koichva. That's why Rabbi Kiva thought Bar Koichva was Mashiach because he waged major military uh, victories for the Jewish people. But on, until you wage a war, then it's irrelevant how many people you influence. That is not a factor. Until you bring the Jewish people back to the land of Israel, then it's irrelevant what miracles you do. Until you build the base Hamikdash, it's not relevant how many followers you have. These were all the criteria that Rabbi Yaakov Sasporst used. And then Rabbi Yaakov Sasporst writes, look at number six. He said, does it say in any sefer that if a guy says he's a Mashiach, you have to believe him? It says that somewhere? Where does it say that? In which Gemara does it say? A guy comes in to the shul and he says, I'm Mashiach. It says somewhere you have to believe him. Did he meet all the criteria of the Rambam? He says, if, um, listen very carefully, I, somebody might perform miracles, since when do miracles have to do with Mashiach? The Rambam gives many criteria. He doesn't say one time that if a Mashiach, if a Messianic figure makes a miracle, that shows he's a Mashiach. It shows someone's a Navi. We know that it says in the Torah that if someone performs a miracle, and then that will establish someone as the prophet of Hashem. But it will not establish someone as Mashiach. It's irrelevant to Mashiach. Otherwise, every Rebbe, the, uh, the, the uh, Rebbe Yaxas Brothers writes, before there was even such thing as a Rebbe. He says, otherwise, anybody who has Hasidim, the more people have Hasidim, the more Mashiach still be. Because uh, this one has followers, that one has followers. The answer is followers are irrelevant. It's a technical, you have to meet the technical requirements of Halacha. Namely, you've got to bring the Jewish people back to Israel. You've got to rebuild the Temple. Until then, Kama Yoisi Ika So why was he the only one to think, I mean... We mentioned, right? The fervor of the people influence the top because the top cannot be tied down to the to the multitude moreover Shabtai Tzvi is revealing when Mashiach will be but Chazal say that there's an oath that the Navi cannot reveal when Mashiach is coming and uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sasporta says, that which you accuse me of not having faith in Mashiach and not believing in Mashiach, no, just the opposite. I'm the only one who actually believes in Mashiach. You, you people out there who are willing to accept anyone who's influential as Mashiach, it's because you don't really believe in it. So you're willing to accept somebody that deep down you know it will prove that they're not the real thing. And then people are going to say, oh, he's not Mashiach. Eh, forget the whole thing. You're not worried that if, that if it's proven that your Messiah is not Mashiach, then people are just going to drop the whole uh, tenet entirely? So it means deep down you don't really believe in it. I'm the one who really believes in it. That's why I'm so cautious. It better be the right one. Now, Says Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, you know what else I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of worse than that. Not only am I afraid that people will, will become disbelievers in the concept of the Mashiach, but we know what happened with Yeshua Hanoitri. What happened? People who believed he was the Messiah 
What happened after he died? So, you know, people, uh, they, can't, they can't agree, they can't admit that they made a mistake. So as soon as he died, you had some people who said, no, no, he came back, he came back, you missed it, he, he came back. Or he's coming back. And then years later, more and more people accepted that he came back. And then it became a false religion. Says, says, I'm afraid that if somebody is accepted as Mashiach without meeting the halacha criteria, this is no different than the way that Christianity uh, uh, began. He didn't come back, actually? He actually didn't come back? No, that's... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we discussed that in a different year. Now, Shabtai Tzvi had a prophet... You know what was his prophet's name? Nathan of Gaza, Nasan Hazasi. And he prophesied that Shabtai Tzvi is going to be Mashiach. And by the way, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas adds a very, very important point. He says, he says, I have a question. <coughs> really? Shabtai Tzvi is the Mashiach? I must have missed Elio Anavi. I must have missed that day that Elio Anavi came before Mashiach came. If Elijah the prophet doesn't come, this week's Parsha, that's what we're talking about it this week. Right? <laughs> that if Elijah the prophet doesn't come, then the person is not Mashiach. Then he can't be Mashiach. If Eliyahu Hanavi did not precede this individual, then this person is not Mashiach. That alone is ironclad, definitive proof that it's not Mashiach. And so, but we don't need a Navi to come first. Since when does a Navi have to precede Mashiach? There is no Navi that precedes Mashiach. Only Eliyahu. And if a Navi comes, it's to bring people back to Tshuva. But Mashiach does not bring people back to Tshuva. That's not Mashiach's job. <coughs> not only that, says Rabbi Yaakov even if a guy would come in and say he's Mashiach, and he was Mashiach, I would still say, I don't believe in you until you prove it. And you know what? I would get schar for saying that. There's no chiv to believe in someone until the onus of proof is on the individual, not just because you heard people talking stories. Stories never happened. People, you know, stories develop in people's minds. They convince themselves that things happen based on bits of information that they... We don't, we don't uh, conduct ourselves that way. They change all the time. Yeah. Says, look, take a look at number 8. He says, uh, Please tell me, O fool, you think someone who doesn't believe in your Mashiach is like a koifer in the Torah? Please tell me, number 1, where's Eliyahu Anavi that Chazal say in the Sech uh, is going to be preceded by... Um, that the Mashiach is going to be preceded by Ilya and Navi. Right? The Gemara says, excuse me, in Erevin, and Afnam Gimel Ahmed Beis, says uh, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, the Zoyar says in Parshas Nayach, there's going to be a great rainbow before Mashiach comes. Did you, did you, was there a rainbow? What about the Gemara in Sanhedrin? About all the miracles Mashiach will perform. Did you see any miracles? What about all the signs the Zoyar talks about in Parshas Vayera? Or at the end of Parshas Balak. Really, he's Mashiach, so how come he doesn't rule over Yushalayim? And why is Yushalayim still Bechorbana? What about the Yushalmi that says Beis Hamikdash is going to be built before Mashiach comes? What about Moshe and Aaron that are going to come with Mashiach according to Taisus? No, no, it's not important. As long as he has a lot of followers and he does good stuff, as long as he does good stuff, and we have miraculous tales that make so Mashiach. Are you kidding me? That's how you live your life? That's just, you know, wives' tales. That's not emuna based on real seichel hayasha. As they say, common sense is not so common. How do we verify Elio? How do you verify him? The first thing is, somebody has to claim they're him. In this debacle, nobody ever even claimed to be Elio Anavi. You know why? Because we would probably say, really, you're Elio Anavi? So why are you uh, eating chocolate chip cookies? You know? 
we're going to talk about uh, some of the activities that Shabbat Day Tzvi engaged in, which are uh, quite, <laughs> quite bizarre, to say the least. So all of these questions, Rav Yaakov Sasportas was in a situation in life where he was able to see things at face value. He wasn't bribed by the, uh, by the influences and by the pressures of, of uh, his position. He takes this even further. He says, <coughs> Who is this guy Nathan of Gaza? Since when does Mashiach have a prophet sidekick? This is a new invention. Mashiach doesn't have any, any uh, Navi. Now one of the things that they were talking about, and Shabtai Tzvi said, was Mashiach ben Yosef had been killed in a war in Poland. His name was Avram Zalman. Rabbi Yaakov said, what? Avraham Zalman? Is Mashiach ben Yosef? What war was there? Oh, there was a war between the the Poles. Mashiach ben Yosef is not going to be killed in a war of Goyim. It's going to be killed in the war of the Jewish people and the enemies of the Jewish people. So just because someone died, you know, how quick are people say, oh, Mashiach is coming? Basically, based on some kind of, you know, nebulous little seemingly unusual occurrence. You need very convincing and a preponderance of evidence and criteria and, ingre- and ingredients. And uh, one of the things that the followers of Shabbat Yitzhi said, look, all the ge- Goyim are talking about the miracles of Shabbat Yitzhi. Obviously Hashem is giving Shabbat Yitzhi a lot of heavenly success. So Rabbi Yaakov says, Sporta says, you can't trust them. Why do you think they're talking? You know why they're talking about it? They're exaggerating it as much as possible because they know there's going to be a big downfall. So the more they play it up now, the more it's go- the repercussions are going to be in the end. And sure enough, uh, you would have thought that when Shabtai Tzvi converted to Islam, this would have put uh, the matter to rest. No. It just got going. Okay, so... Um, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the practices of Shabtai Tzvi. First of all, uh, the, one of the first things he did was he pronounced the four-letter uh, name of God. He was Hoiga Hashem Ba'isi Yosef. He danced with Nashim. He was Mechal of Shabbos. He was Makar of the Karim Pesach. And Benoigea, our subject tonight, he was Mavato Latanisim, which always is a, a popular... Um, practice as a rabbinic figure. If you could be mavato tanesim, that's always, uh, you got something going. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, that very soon. So, Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas mentions that as, as strange as his behavior became, and as flagrant as, as, as his violations were, he started eating the Gid Hanosha, the more followers he had, because he was able to explain it, al Kabbalah, with uh, his understanding of the Zayar, how this is needed, he needs to go into the dark side to pull out the sparks of Kedusha. He had everything explained. So, finally, Shabtai Tzvi was in a prison in Gallipoli, and uh, his followers named this prison that he was in the Migdalois, the Tower of Strength. Now, this is recorded by Rabbi Yaakov Emden in the Tairas Haknois. Take a look at number 17. And you'll see how he mockingly... I've seen this many times in my life. You know, miraculous stories that people say. You know, I hear about it all the time. He's, so a guy came running in. He said, you know, I was on a certain street and a man in a long white beard, he came and he told me, are you Jewish? I said, yeah. He said, why would you cut off your payas? You have tzitzis that are a puzzle. I said, really? And sure enough, I looked at my tzitzis and there were a few strings that were ripped. And I said, why are you asking me about this? And he said, because, do you know who's coming? Chariots of the ten tribes are coming from the other side of the Sambat Yain. And they're coming to Eretz Yisrael. They will kill anyone who doesn't have kosher tzitzis. Anyone who violates anything. And then... I turned around and he was gone. It must have been Elio Anavi. And people started reporting all kinds of things. And then one guy said, Did you see it? Did you see it? And everyone said, Yeah, 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 because you know, 
you don't want to be a fool that you, you didn't see Eliyahu Anavi when, when this Ap- Amor saw him and, and you, you didn't see him. I mean, this guy who can't read an Aleph from a base saw Eliyahu and you're already, you could read Kamatz Aleph A. Uh. You didn't see Eliyahu, so people, everyone, everyone saw Eliyahu Anavi. So Rabbi Yaakov Emden records Shabtai Tzvi was sitting in his castle in the city of Kushtio. He was we- wearing red clothing with the Sefer Torah. By the way, the sons of the Taz came to him. And the Taz was very weak at the time. And he gave special begadim to the sons of the Taz. He said, put it on your father. As soon as he wears it, he's going to be energized like a young man. And he was wearing pa'moinim, rimoinim. And he promised the sons of the Taz that he heard the reports about the Kazakh uprising in Ukraine, that he's going to personally avenge the uh, Kazakhs and he was, uh, the Shabtai who was always holding the Sefer Torah in his right hand. And the room he was in was overlaid with gold. And the floor was laden with silver. And there was a silver table in front of him, coated with gold. And he had an inkwell with a feather. And everything he ate was in great royalty. And there were many rooms in the prison and there was an orchard there, and there was a guard there, and as you could imagine, in order to get into the Sea Shop Tzvi, this was more than, you know, front row uh, Yankee Stadium. You know, this was big bucks to see Shop Tzvi. And people said, you know, I don't understand, he's being accused of re- rebelling against uh, the uh, Sultan, so why don't they kill him? It must be heavens protecting him. <laughs> no, the Sultan was protecting him. Because in order to get into Shabtai Tzvi, you know how much, you couldn't slip the guy, you know, a few bucks. You got you to stup the guy big time to get into see Shabtai Tzvi. Then they started taking advantage. They had concession stands in the palace. So if you wanted to see Shabtai Tzvi and get some good essen, that, that was going to cost you a pretty penny. So they got a whole, they got a whole uh, show going on over there. <laughs> you know, with, with, I'm sure they had good merch as well, you know. <laughs> and Shab Tetsi was sitting there with Sifrei Kabbalah open in front of him. And Shab Tetsi then said, I'm now 40 years old. And the Shekhinah has come out of Golos. And therefore we do not fast anymore on the 17th day of Tammuz and on Tisha B'av. And a, a Rav came in to, to greet him. Rev, the Ra Kuk Kush, and he asked him, "Why are you not, not fasting on Tisha B'av? And he and he said, "I'll tell you why, because my name Shabtai Tzvi backwards stands for Yoim Tisha B'av Shabtai Tzvi Bal Yisane. So those letters backwards spell out Shabtai Tzvi doesn't fast on Tisha B'av, and he issued a decree that no longer can the Jewish people fast on Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz and Tisha B'av. And instead of fasting, they should make a Yom Tif. They should rejoice, eating and drinking. By the way, we're just going to take a break. That if this, uh, if this information is scaring you, this is not for you. This is not for your children. Don't say it over at the Shabbos table. Don't, don't talk about it. Switch the channel. Watch uh, something. Watch some uh, about s- nice stories of inspiration. But if you want to know what happened, then, you know, back to Shabtai Tzvi said, you need to make Kiddush on Shabbat Shabbat Tammuz. You need to make Havdalah. And wear, and wear Big Day Yamtif. And then, this is all recorded by Rabbi Yaakov Emdin in the Taras HaKnois. He says, My dear residents of Izmir, peace unto you. I decree, me, the son of, David, of Solomon ben David, he called himself, this coming Tishabav. We're going to make a Yom Mishta Gadol, a Yom Simcha Gadoyla, with good drinks and a lot of Nerois. This comes from your king, Shin Sadi. And on, on, you have to do Malacha Gemura. I'm sorry. You have to make it a Yom Tiv Gamor, no Malacha, except Amira La'akum is Mutter even by the Oiraisas. Okay, so that was a special Kula they had. They, had it, they weren't allowed to do Malacha, but Amira La'akum, ah, oh, so what did they daven? So we have over here Rabbi Yaakov Emden preserved the Nusuch HaTfila of that Tisha B'Av. V'atiten lanu Hashem leikeinu mo'yadim l'simcha chagim uzmanim l'sasen es yoim chag hanechama hazeh. And then he ordered the Mizmoyrim that should be said 
at certain times which prakam of Tehillim, and you make Kiddush, and you make a Shechianu, and then you come back to Shul, you say Halel Gomor with a bracha, and then you read the Parshas HaShavua. Well, what's the Parshas HaShavua of Aschanan? Uh, Mixar of Tishba of Aschanan. How many Aliyos? No? It's Yom Tif. Five Aliyos. Five Aliyos. And the Haftar is Koyamar Hashem Matzachim Midbar. He got the whole thing figured out. Or he probably made Mach Zoyrim. You could get leather editioned. You know, interlinear, you know, big size, small size for the chazan, you know, for the chassan, for the kala, everything figured out. Ashkenaz, svard, whatever you needed. Now, on that Shiva Asabatamas, between 11 and 12, all the false prophets, they said, we're having vibes that everyone needs to eat because the Shabtai Tzvi is eating now, and they all ate, and sure enough, they found out just at that moment the Shabtai Tzvi was eating and drinking at that time. So, this gives you a little bit of a flavor of the times of uh, what was taking place in the 17th century. And this was a war, not just against the uh, Hamoin Am, but there were many great people who, because of the difficulty that Klaiso found itself in, because of the um, Kazakh massacres, that uh, were also swept away in this fervor. But if you want to get a little bit of a picture of the halachic uh, implication that this had, I'm going to share with you just a few tshuvahs. Shalas tshuva Shvos Yaakov. Shvos Yaakov was Rabbi Yaakov Reisher. He wanted to know, are you allowed to eat meat and drink wine on the night before a bris milah in the nine days? You hear the question? The night before bris milah, you're allowed to eat meat and drink wine during the nine days. I don't think we do it, right? But at a bris you could do it. You nowadays, for some reason, on a regular night of the year, everyone's eating steak. Comes to a bris mila, no. Bagels and cream cheese. Who eats bagels and cream cheese today? You could eat a bagel. I mean, a bagel is enough calories for like two weeks, right? But it comes to a sudas mitzvah, what do people do? They buy the cheapest possible food. Bagels and cream. Really, you're supposed to have uh, fleshics. The night before, are you allowed to have fleshix? Says Rabbi Yaakov Reisher, it's mutter, meikar hadin. Why? He says, says Rabbi Yaakov Reisher, the truth is, you want to know what I think about having fleshix the night before a bris? Avada, it's mutter. The whole reason not to have meat, it's only minag ba'alma, it's avelos yeshana. Says Rabbi Yaakov Reish, I always let people eat meat the night before Basmila. But that was back in the day. But nowadays, where there's so many Api Karsim that still believe in that filthy lie of the Shabtai Tzvi. This is again afterwards. Okay? And they're Mazalzel and Tishabov. There were still Jews eating on Tishabov. Because there were Gedolim who went along with the Psak of Shabtai Tzvi. Says Rabbi Yaakov Reisher, since they're Jews from Mazalzal and Tishabav, by the way, their bones should rot and their souls should rot, those who believe in him. Now, I say nowadays you cannot eat meat or drink wine the, nap, the night before a milah. And he says, I don't believe But the day of the milah, uh, it's for sure mutter. But you see how uh, the practices and the uh, ramifications of what was happening in the time of Shabtai Tzvi actually affected the Piskei uh, Halacha in, uh, in the aftermath of this, uh, of this event. Now if you look at number 19, the Shari Knesset Hagdala of Rav Benavisti, who was, uh, at first he did go along with the, the fervor. He talks about smoking, sm- uh, drinking totos on a tainus yachid. So he says yeah, he doesn't find any makam la'asroi, because we were never makabel for a tainus yachid not to smoke, unless you're going to drink the tobacco on Yom Tif itself, but not to do it on Tishabav. Turn you, on. 
turn off. Next corner, Con Edison. Con Edison? I think I got the wrong number. Con Edison for the on no, 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 no. I don't need Con Ed right now. Okay, so he says that um, somebody who partakes of this tobacco on Tishabov, he has choice words for uh, this lenient practice on Tishabov. So it's very interesting. Many hundreds of, uh, hundreds of years later, the Shal Shachiva Zechar Yehoisif of uh, Rabbi Yosef Zechariah Stern. He talks about that the Shirei Knesset Hagdoila originally went along with the fervor, uh, and including not fasting on Tishbav based on these false reports. And he even went so far as to remove Rav Aaron Lafafa, who opposed the Shabtai Tzvi. And therefore, later on in history, the Shirei Knesset Hagdoila in the following years, he ossered on Tishbav many Inuyim that are not mechoyiv me'ikar hadin, in order to show that all the people who are being lenient in uh, Tishabav have a din of a tzedoiki. And uh, for that reason, people started smoking on Yom Tif because the uh, Shabtai Tzvi became a lenient on Yom Tif. That's one of the reasons, aside from whether you are or not allowed to smoke on Yom Tif, this has historical implications because uh, it was considered sort of a sign of following Shabtai Tzvi. You're going to smoke on Yom Tif to show that Yom Tif's not important uh, so much now. It's the Yikar is Tishabav. So therefore, the uh, Shari Knesset Agda was very machmer about smoking on Yom Tif. The bottom line is that Ein Chadash Tachas Hashemesh. You know, whatever, whatever happens happened many, many times. And it's important to learn from, uh, from events that occurred in our past what the proper attitude should be. And that is, we follow the approach of the Rashba. Very healthy speculation is the tried and true approach of Klal Yisrael. The onus of proof is on the one making the claim. And until they fulfill the specific halachic requirements, namely, they're preceded by Elio Anavi, the, the tshuva of Klal Yisrael, as wonderful as it is, is not a halachic requirement. What is a halachic requirement is fighting the physical wars against the enemies of Israel. What is a halachic requirement is building the base Hamikdash is gathering Klal Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael. The Gemara talks about Moshe and Aaron will be there. The Gemara talks about the Zayin Royim, the Ches Nesichim, the rainbow the Zayar talks about. But just miraculous tales, Loimala, at best, Loimala. At best, they don't make things better. But if we didn't believe in Moshe Rabbeinu because of Moivsim, then we don't believe in nobody because of Moivsim. And tales that people say, I guess it's better than talking about uh, politics, maybe. But it's loy male v'loy moirid, not in halacha, not in hashkafa, and not in derech hachayim. We follow the Shulchan Aruch, we follow the hashkafa brought in Talmud Bavli, Talmud Yushalmi, and we all await the day, an imamim be'amun ha'shalema, v'viyas ha'mashiach, and the best way to show Amuna and the coming of Mashiach is by not eating tomorrow. Because by fasting, Shiva Sabatamos, you're not just saying, you're declaring with every fiber of your being that right now we believe by Amuna Shalema, that we still await the Goyal Tzedek. And we have to give, we have to have tremendous Hakaras Hatoiv to Gedolim, like Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, who had the uh, clarity and the honesty to uh, weed out any Deois Koizvois and keep, keep us pure so that we could be Zachet to the Gula Shlema and the Bias Goyal Tzadik Mherbi Amen. Amen. Shkoyach. Next week, uh, there's no Shir Wednesday night. We'll see you back in two weeks. Call Tov. Sure. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.